So, <clears throat> independence is one thing that you probably have heard about before, at least most of you. We also mentioned it briefly already. So, if knowledge about x does not give any about information about y, that means that the conditional distribution of y given x is just the marginal distribution of y. That's basically, you can say, within this context, the way of defining it. So that means if that holds both ways, x does not depend on y and y does not depend on x, that means that the joint density is just a product of the marginal densities. That's the definition of independence. And a small disclaimer, in the exercise, one of the exercises for today, it says that things are uncorrelated where sh it should say independent. You will know where that is when you get to it. Brunt is close. So, Expectation, I don't know how much you've seen this. Some of you have probably seen it to some extent. <clears throat> but if you look at a univariate case, what you're looking at of a random variable with density of x of x, then the expectation is defined as the integral or the outcome space where you integrate x times the density of x in the continuous case and in the discrete case it's just a sum, but it's the same thing that you're doing. Now, one thing that is important to notice is that the expectation here, well, is an integral of something. It's a linear operator that you apply. Think of it as an integral, but basically what you're going to be applying is that the expectation of a sum of some independent uh, sum of different terms is just the expectation of each of the terms individually. And of course, if you do look at a constant, the expectation of a constant is just a constant, right? If you have a constant inside an integral, you can move it outside the integral. You've done that many times, I assume. So those are, that's the first calculation rule. There'll be more in a slide in a moment. But first, just talk about moments. What you've probably heard about is the variance. But before getting to the variance, we will just look at the nth moment. That's just as before, that instead of just integrating x times the density of x or the outcome space, you integrate x to the nth power to get the nth moment. So basically, you can take the expectation of any function of x, you write that any function in there of x, and integrate. Multiply it by the density and integrate over the outcome space. So that's, that's it. Now, that's the moment. Then we have what is called a central moment. That is where the only difference is that you take and subtract the first order moment, the expected value or the mean value, before raising to the power. And it's the same thing. What the expectation of a function of x is the integral of that function of x times the density of x integrated over the outcome space. So this is the variance. You've probably seen this calculation rule before. Do you also recall how to get from there to there? It's one of those things that you'll be doing a lot of similar calculations. So if you look at the variance of x, well, 
That is defined as the expectation of, that's the second order central moment, expectation of x minus the expectation of x square. Now, all you have to do to work this out is first you just multiply out in here. So it's the expectation of x square. And then we have the, the second term square. Let me just, did I write anything more here? I think I'll write it out without putting too many extra things in here. Then I have x times the expectation of x with a negative sign, x times the expectation of x. And then I have the expectation of x with x, again with a negative sign, times x. And finally, what I have is the expectation of x squared And everything here is inside an expectation. So what to do here is to use the calculation rule from before and say that the expectation is a linear operator. So we can do the expectation of all the individual terms. So we have the expectation of x squared minus now, the expectation of x, what is that? Is that a random variable or is that a constant? It's a constant, exactly. So we have the expectation of x times a constant. So we get the expect that means that we get, ah, maybe I should write it uh, in two steps. x times the expectation of x. And then I have the same thing here, expectation of the expectation of x times x, and then plus expectation of x square. And then I will just fill in expectation of x square and repeat this. And then as this is a constant, the expectation of x, I can move it outside, and that means what I get from here is the expectation of x that I moved outside times the expectation of x minus, and this gives the same thing, expectation of x times expectation of x plus the last bit out here that I can also write as expectation of x times expectation of x. And what you'll see here is that this one cancels out with that one. So what we're left with down here is the expectation of x squared minus ah, the expectation of x squared. So that's the reasoning. What you should often see is that Sometimes the expectation of something is zero. We'll get back to many cases of that. When it's the, an epsilon that you have, that means when you take expe expectation of something that is zero and multiply that on something different, you multiply by zero and get rid of a lot of terms. That's one of the things that we'll be doing a lot of times later on. Now, the covariance is basically 
just the same thing as you've probably seen this before as well. The covariance between two random variables is the same structure as what we have down here. But instead of doing x minus expectation of x squared, we take the x1 minus expectation of 1 multiplied by x2 minus expectation of x2. So it's basically like the variance, but it's a covariance between how does x1 and x2 covary. And you can do the same calculations, walk through, and you get that it's the expectation of the product of the two minus the product of the expectations of the two. And of course, the covariance of x with itself is just the variance. This calculation rule here is one that you will be using. Here it's only with two terms, but of course you can do it with any number of terms that you like. So you have the covariance of a times x1 plus b times x2, comma c times x3 plus d times x4. It's just like multiplying polynomials together. It's just doing the multiplication. Thinking of it like this, don't go all the way there. Just think of it and say, well, then I have the first term with the first term. That's what I have here. The constant goes outside. Then I have the first term with the second term. That's what I have here. The second term with the first term and the second term with the second term. So it's just like multiplication, what you've seen before, multiplying two parentheses together. It's just covariance that you're doing. It's again the expectation operator that is linear that helps out doing these things. So if you can do it in this way, rather than to kind of do all the multiplications and try to f collect the right terms, it's much easier. And that's one of the things that's a lot of in here is to figure out what is the easiest way to get from A to B. It's not necessarily just to plug everything in and just start calculating. You have to think a little bit before getting started. Then you can find a shortcut in many cases. And of course, it also works for the variance. This is basically what we wrote here, just with other letters that, well, adding a constant to a random variable doesn't change the variance, but if you multiply by a constant, the variance becomes the constant squared times the variance of the random variable. So one of the exercises today will be asked to do a second order moment representation. That means not just finding the second order moment, but find everything up to the second order. So if you're going to a third order moment representation, you need the first, second, and third order moments. We generally will stick to things that are normally distributed. That means that we won't go above the second order moment. The rest is not interesting. So we need the mean, the variance, and the covariance. So that was a little bit for univariate. Now, if we go for random vectors or multivariate systems, well, the expectation of a vector, well, you just do element-wise expectations. That's what it's written here. So the variance-covariance matrix of X, well, it's similar to what we did down here. The problem is if X minus mu, or the expectation of x, is a vector. It doesn't make sense to take a vector and multiply it by itself. What we do is we take the outer product to get a matrix out of it. So what we have is, effectively, you get 
in that here, you get the first element with the first element, the second element with the first, and so forth in the columns. And then in the rows, that gives you what is the first element. That means in the diagonal, what you get there are the variances, and in the off-diagonal elements, you get the covariances of the univariate variables. And of course, what we talked about earlier on, uppercase sigma, which will label this as here, it has to be symmetric. That means that the covariance between x2 and x1 is the same as the covariance between x1 and x2. Well, we learned that before. And I assume that you all know how to get from a covariance to a correlation. You take the covariance between the two and divide by the square root of the product of the variances of the two. Sometimes written as you divide by the standard deviation of the two instead of the square root of the variances of the two. But that's a simple thing, right? One thing to notice is when you have a sigma ij, this is actually a squared term. So sometimes you may see sigma i i. That is the same as sigma i square, because that's the i i element in the uppercase sigma, which is the variance. So when we have two subscripts on a, on a lowercase sigma, it will be a, a covariance. That's one thing that is a little bit irritating until you just accept it. Because you've been used to say whenever you have a sigma, it's a standard deviation. But now when you have two subscripts, it's a covariance. And if the subject is the same twice, I mean, sigma ii in that case, then it's also a variance. So this is one of the things that is also, you can say, annoying. And that's the reason for the comment I made about the assignment today or exercise today. So if x and y are independent, then the covariance is 0. Don't won't go through the proof of that, and the correlation is of, co is of course also zero in that case. Now, just an example: if x is a standard normal distribution, and look at the co covariance between x and x square, then well, that's the expectation of the product of the two minus the product of the expectation of the two parts. And this is an example where the expectation of x for a standard, when x is a standard normal, that's a zero. So that means that the last term out here cancels out. So we're left with expectation of x cubed. And if we do that integral, it's zero. So they are uncorrelated as such, but if we do the conditional expectation of x2 given x equal x, well, we get x2 uh, x squared. So that means that if we have independence, then it implies no correlation, but lack of correlation does not imply independence. That's an important thing to notice. We will often be in the linear case where everything works out smoothly. Um, but remember, independence is the interesting property. Correlation is something in between in, in the calculations. Now, what if what we did before was the covariance matrix of x? Now. We can also do the covariance between x and y, where both are random variables. Sorry, multivariate random var variables. And they may not be at the same dimension. They don't have to be that. So, well, we have the correlation matrix, 
that should actually be in the previous slide, whatever. Um, that's just organizing the rows in a matrix. That's fairly straightforward. We have the covariance matrix between X and Y. Again, it's similar to what we did down here. We take the expectation of X minus the mean value of X, and then we transpose Y minus the mean value of Y, and do the expectation of that. So that means we get a matrix where we have all the combination of covariances between the different elements. One thing I didn't say, but is implicit, otherwise things would not work out this way, is whenever you have a vector, it's a column vector. Now, there's a lot of calculation rules for this as well. Um, and the special case for the variance here is basically if you take a times x and look at the variance of this, what becomes then the variance of that? That is similar to what we had down here with the univariate case, just in order to make the dimensions fit. That's the, also the good reason why you want to do this. If A is not symmetric, this will, you can say the product of A times X has a different dimension. And of course, the covariance matrix for that should have the right dimension. Therefore, you have to pre-multiply by A and post-multiply by A transpose. Then you'll make sure that what you get out has as many, um, I have to say it right, uh, rows as A, as A. So the one thing to, to remember is we still need to do the constant square, but we pre-multiply by the matrix A and post multiply by the transpose. And it's always a good idea to check dimensions. Now, conditional expectation is just like expectation, and, and we have the conditional distribution function over here. So what we do here is that instead of integrating with respect to the density of y, we integrate with respect to the conditional density of y, given x. That's all you do. So you say, again, given that x2 is this, that, or the other, what is then the distribution of x? What is then the expectation? Exactly what is on this line. That's the definition of the conditional expectation. Now, if X and Y are independent, what did we learn previously? If they are independent, then the conditional expectation is equal to the marginal distribution. I'm oh, sorry, the conditional distribution is equal to the marginal distribution, and thereby the expectation of Y given X is equal to just the expectation of Y because there's no information in X about Y when they're independent. That's one of the quite easy ones. And I'll say this page of calculation rules is one thing that you will, but you better find the place in the book where you have it on the slides. Just notice where you have it. Some of them are fairly straightforward and others are, you need to think a little bit harder to say, what is the reason for this? Why would I ever do this? So the next one is one of those, but we'll get back to motivation of that. So the expectation of Y given X, is one of the mind boggling thing here is the conditional expectation when you condition on a random variable, not by saying that it's equal to a particular value, but saying that I condition on it as a random variable x here. That is still a random variable. So when I then do the expectation of that random variable without conditioning, then it becomes a constant. 
or the expectation of y in this case because that's what I'm expecting on. But I'm doing a small trick with the x. I will show you how that comes in handy later on. So what I mentioned earlier is, is also is, well, no, so I didn't mention this one earlier. If you do the expectation of a function g of x times y and you condition on x, well, then condition on x, this term here is, you can say, just g of x. So you can take that outside. What is interesting is, you can say, the expectation of y given x. So when you condition on something that depends on, when you condition on x and the thing that you condition depends on x, you can take the x part out. And the expectation of g of x times y, well, you can do that since we're going to do the expectation of, of x anyhow, of everything, then you can take this y part here and say, well, maybe if you can actually write something about y easily when you know x, say, if you know x1, it's, it's easy to say something about x2 and vice versa, then you can do that calculation in two steps. So rather than doing the complicated things where you treat both x and y as random variable, then you, when you do this, this here is a function of x, no longer a function of y. So all of a sudden, you, you, what is left is just the expectation of x. So you're only left with one integral instead of a double integral. Hopefully, you don't have to do the integral, but doing the right separation, you can get around it. Expecta expectation of a constant is just a constant. That's one of the easier ones. The expectation of a function of x, condition on x, is just the same function of x, and it's still a random variable. So that's again repeating. Whenever you condition on a random variable, what you get out is still a random variable. This is basically also what was part of the solution up here. And then the conditional expectation is also a linear operator, just like the expectation. So when you have an expectation of a sum of elements conditioning on something, you can take the sum of the conditional expectations instead. You can also do the same thing for variances. So conditional variance and different conditional covariance, it's basically just like what we did in the simple univariate case, where everywhere you have an expectation, the last bit of that expectation is condition on x, condition on x, condition on x. So all the calculation of derivation is exactly the same, except that you write condition on x everywhere appropriate. Likewise, for the covariance, well, you have the y's here and you have the sets there. Everywhere it says expectation. The last bit is expectation of x, expectation of x, and expectation of x. So it's the same thing that we look at the conditional density function of y and set and do the math but hopefully we don't have to do the integrals. So here comes one of the reasons for doing the split. If you want to say something about y, but y is kind of depending on x and how to get to y. First you do this intermediate step, and then you get y as a second step. If, that, if you can construct that, then the variance of y is the expectation of the variance of y condition of x plus the variance of the expectation of y condition on x. Notice what you have is the expectation of the variance plus the variance of the expectation. So you just have them both ways. <laughs> 
And then for the covariance, it's the same thing. This is one of the things that is difficult to say, right? But again, it is the expectation of the covariance plus the covariance of the expectations. So it's everything here is parallel calculations. And this is also true for vectors. So all this can be done. And you say, well, it becomes more complicated this way. Yes, it does take one step into a more complicated space, but the alternative of trying to solve the problem directly, you wouldn't have, you can say, the tools to go into that unless you solve the integral. So this way you can get around and do some simple things. The last topic, as I recall for today, is the linear projection theorem. You've all done linear regressions, and when you do the linear regression, there's one thing that you may not have thought of, but let's just draw a simple linear regression. We have some observations. We have an x, we have an y, and then we fit. Let me just put some a little bit of extra variance on here. And then what we do is that we have a fit. I assume you all have done that. Now, when you do this, what is it that you do? You fit a straight line, y equals a times x plus b plus epsilon. That's what you do, right? How do you measure? And what you minimize is the sum of squared residuals. So how do you measure this epsilon? So the epsilon related to this observation down here, where is that epsilon? Does the question make sense? How do, how do I draw that epsilon? Yes? Exactly, it's a vertical distance to the line. That's the, that's the epsilon for that particular observation. Now, when you do linear regression, you assume that x is observed with no variance. In that case, this makes sense. But what if x is also uncertain? Does it still make sense? I mean, this x could be anywhere. Or it should only be in one direction, but just to show it. You have some, some, let me make it right. You have the observation, and then it has some distribution to it. So the, the vertical line is not, you can say, the best. Probably you want to do something that is more orthogonal to the line there. It all depends on the relative variance. What is the uncertainty in, on y, and what is the uncertainty on x? That is what is the question. So when you have random vectors in general, but let's just think of them as scalars for now, it's just presented in a multivariate way up here. Then we can define the variance of the yx combined vector here as you can say that's the covariance matrix of y, that's the covariance matrix of x, and that's the covariance between x and y and y and x. And those two there are each other's transpose, the two orthogonal elements there. So how we define the linear projection theorem of y on x is the mean value of y. And then we look at how does the x, how far is the x value from the mean of x. And then you look at the variance of x and the covariance between y and x slash correlation. 
So you take the mean value and say, how far am I away from that in the x direction? And why? what is the center of considering this in the same way as what we have up here? As just a multivariate or bivariate, in this case, normal distribution of points or of, uh, of data, if we were to have data, but in general, just a bivariate normal distribution. Then when you have an observation on one axis and you want to say, how can I make a projection down on the other axis? What is the most likely value of x given y? So it becomes a linear function, have a mean value plus, and the mean value comes from the mu of x, and then you also have a constant part down here from mu of x, sorry, mu of y, and then mu of x here multiplied by this scalar here. And the variance of the difference between y and the linear projection of y on x, that becomes, you can say, the variance of y. You have the covariance here. And then you have to look at what do you do here with the x. We can go through the math of this. It takes, I won't have time to do that. Um, if you look at the covariance between this error here and x, then it is zero. So your projection down to a space where there is no correlation or covariance between the two. Basically, what happens in the derivation is that you have a scalar here and when you take the variance, when you take the variance of a times x, it is a times the variance of x, a transpose. That's all you have to do, and then there will be some matrices that cancel out, and bang, you're there. So you can see the y sigma yx there, that is pre-multiplied and post-multiplied, but we're left with only one sigma xx in here because there is a sigma x, x inverse here, but you will have one from both sides, but we'll show that later. So we call it linear projections. What we're mostly going to use here are conditional expectations or conditional means. So it minimizes the variance among functions, as linear functions, that gives projection errors that are uncorrelated with x. That's the formal definition of what we have. If x and y are multivariate normal, that is also the conditional expectation. But if we go back and take the same problem as before, x is standard normal, then the linear projection of x square, or x on x square, is 1, while the conditional expectation is x square. That's because it's a nonlinear function. So whenever you have linear function, it works out. Um, and we will generally just use the conditional expectation. Well, basically because everyone else does. In practice, whenever things are normal, that's also the case. It's true. And the linear projection has the same calculation rule as the conditional expectation when you have the normal distribution. But when you have things that are non-normal, so x squared is, non, is not a normal distribution anymore, then it doesn't hold anymore. But we'll try to kind of restrict ourselves to where things are normal. At the end, a small example using the linear projection theorem. I should have done one more thing. <laughs> 
啊。You know, sorry for a two-second wait. Here we are. I'm just waiting for it to be ready to freeze because I just want to save that one there. Okay, then I'll just freeze the other one. So this is where we just were. <coughs> so in the example, we have some data for NOx. I don't know how much you remember about the diesel gate story. NOx is a composition of NO2 and NO, but you usually report the combination of the two because depending on temperature and other things, you'll have a, a balance of a mixture of the two gases. So what we will have here is we'll define x1 will be at time t. That is the nitrogen dioxide concentration at time t minus the mean value of nitrogen dioxide. And x2 is then the nitrogen oxide at time t minus the mean value. And this subtracting the mean value is something that we'll often do because it'll make life easier. Because, yeah, it's a lot of terms that you just get rid of. And pretty much everything that we do can be done and with and without the mean values, the calculation is just easier if you take it out. So that's the definition. We measure every third hour during the day. Nowadays, what is sit sitting and measuring at the same place is measuring every hour. You can get a, a measurement. It's available online if you want it. So what Jacob did back in the days was to fit a model of this structure and we'll get back to fitting model that, that structure later in the course. But if you just look at this, it's a bivariate, if you forget about the error, it's a bivariate discrete um, time di difference equation. So you just take what was there, multiply by matrix to get to the next time. But then you just add some noise in reality because Circumstances have, have changed. So this here says what's going to happen. You have a conversion from one to the other. Uh, you have a conversion from nitrogen dioxide to nitrogen oxide to get a balance between the two. You can also see from the covariance matrix that the correlation, as in the orthogonal element, is fairly large compared to the, it's not greater than, but it's fairly large. So let's just say that we're currently at time 9 o'clock and we've measured those two observations. So what we want to do is to make a prediction to the next sample at noon. So that's what we're going to do. And we're also going to say what is the variance covariance matrix of that forecast. Now, what we want and I'm going to say this again many times, the best predictor is the conditional expectation. So we'll condition on what we just observed and use that to predict. So we know what we just measured. That means that we know those values there because that is time t minus 1 when we, are t we want to say something about time t time at noon. We want to get one step. So the expectation of the concentration at noon, given what we know, well, we just plug in the model here, phi of xt plus epsilon t plus 1, given information up to time t. Now, that means that this one 
is what we're conditioned on. Now the future epsilon, that's just like in any other statistics course. You have an error that we haven't observed, it's out in the future. The expectation of that is zero. So what we're left with is just what is happening from the dynamical system, from the chemical, you can say, balancing of the two different gas phases. Now, the variance covariance of the forecast, well, that is a conditional variance. And what we do is we plug in what is going to happen for the process minus the expected value that we just calculated up here, condition on xt. What is nice to observe is that this term and that term cancels out, so we're looking at the variance of just epsilon t plus 1. That's independent of xt, so we're left with just the covariance matrix. So this is one of the lucky cases where everything becomes simple at the end. Here I just have some code, and I don't think there's anything in here that is just, you can just look at it if you like, R. I will generally show, if you look at, when you look at all the video podcasts and so forth, there will be some times where I just put the code in the video, but most times I'll go to our studio and show you what's going to happen. That also means that when we're doing discussions here on Friday mornings, I will have the same script ready. So if you have questions to what happened at line 53, we can go down and discuss that. So whenever you have questions of that sort, we'll take it like that. So at noon, we were only observe, observing the nitrogen dioxide. For some reason, there was some problem with the equipment. Now, what we need to do is to estimate the missing nitrogen oxide measurement and what is the variance of that error. What we do there is to do the linear projection between the two because what we have, we have a system here where we know the expectation of y and x, we know the covariance structure of them in general from the process, so we have everything that we need to get started over here. And I know this slide is not a nice one to look at. Uh, There's a few too many characters here, but that's just life sometimes. So what we have is we want to compare with the linear projection here. We're looking at the conditional expectation of x2 at time t plus 1, condition on, on x1 at time t plus 1, and then we also have an extra condition on xt. That is going to be there everywhere, and that's the only difference to what is there, is that we add that extra condition on what we knew at the previous time, because we want to keep that information alive, so to speak. So to get the expectation, we need the covariance between y and x. We have the covariance between x1 and x2 here, condition on xt again. Then we need to have the inverse of the variance of x. We have the inverse of variance x1 here, again condition on previous time. And then we have to look at how is x1 different from the expectation of x1. So that's what we have over here, again. We can plug in the numbers everywhere here, and then we get the expectation down here. That's basically just doing the matrix operation from, ah, far back. That's getting, you can say, the second element of what comes out of that, but we just wrote it I just wrote it element-wise here. And it's also elements in the covariance matrix that we have here to first take the covariance between the two and then normalize by the variance and then look at 
how is the observed nitrogen dioxide different from the predicted? And the variance here, we have the prediction variance here, and then we have minus the covariance between y and x, divided by the variance of x, and then post multiplied by the covariance transposed. Now, in this case, it's univariate, so therefore, I don't have to, to pre and post multiply by the covariance. I can just have it square here and then multiply by the inverse of the variance. So this is what I get out when I insert the numbers. So what happens if you just go back? Uh, no, I don't have a slide there. Um, so what is happening here? You have the variance, the prediction variance, that was exactly sigma 2, 2. And then because you observed something from the other state of the dynamical system here, we observed this, then we are able to reduce it. The amount of reduction depends on how large is the covariance between the two states divided by the variance of the one thing that we did observe. So intuitively, it makes sense that the more covariance that you have, the larger reduction you get, and the you see, less variance on x will give you a larger reduction as well. So if you have a large covariance between two and x is very certain, then you also pretty much know where you which value you get here, I mean, on the second dimension. We plug in the math. We should have the updated prediction here. And this number of the covariance, 0 0.95, in order to relate that back to something, we need to go back quite a bit. The one step prediction variance was 23. So we get a reduction. Am I going, going the wrong way? No, too far. What happened there? Here you go, yeah. So we get a reduction from this number is 23, and then we subtract roughly 22. So the, the variance becomes more than 20 times smaller just by observing one of the states, we pretty much know what the other one is. So the highlights from today, just to say the covariance calculation rule, the variance separation theorem, that you can do this conditional variance split up. At first, it looks like making life complicated, but at the end of the day, it, it saves time. And then you have the linear projection theorem, and I put the exp conditional expectation parentheses because it only holds when things are normally distributed and things are nice and well behaved, not like the x square case. And just remember, second order moment representation means both the mean, the variance, and the covariance. Any questions? Let me say one thing. that You've asked much fewer questions than I would expect. Maybe it's just waking up after the summer break. I don't know. But I know that next week, I'm expecting that you'll be the ones asking the questions. And then we'll take it from there. So uh, that's just to emphasize 